try as hard as you can and work really hard at understanding your craft with intense depth. This is the Creative Voyage Podcast, a long-form interview show with the mission to help creative professionals level up. I'm your host, Mario De Picolzuane. I'm a creative professional myself, active in the fields of graphic design, art direction, and creative consulting, working with companies such as Skinfolk, Menu, and Sonos. Through season one of this podcast, I present in-depth interviews with some of the world's most inspiring creative professionals, revealing the stories that shape their lives and careers, plus actionable strategies to help you take your mindset and skills to the next level. I invite you to join me on this journey. This episode is dedicated to industrial and product design. Hi, I'm Tim Rundle. I'm an industrial designer. I'm originally from New Zealand, but I'm now based in London. I have my studio in Hackneywick in East London. The projects the studio takes on are mostly focused around products that exist within architecture. So there's a lot of furniture, lighting for brands like Menu, Resident, SP01, and also some more kind of typical product design projects for brands such as Joseph Joseph and a little bit of strategic consulting as well. Tim's practice is primarily focused on developing technically elegant solutions for everyday objects, with a minimalistic aesthetic approach and enabled by a passion and depth of understanding for materials and manufacturing technology. Earlier this year, I had the pleasure of visiting Tim in his studio in London while we were working on an editorial about his work for Menu, and that's how we met. I admired his designs even before that, but by spending some time in his studio, I realized how thoughtful and generous he is, so he was among the first people I wanted to talk to for this podcast. In this episode, we're going to listen to the highlights of the conversation I had with Tim in September of 2018. We cover topics such as the importance of finding the right clients, his failures and lessons learned, advice to young industrial designers, what makes a good contemporary product, and much more. Alongside running his studio, Tim also teaches at the Royal College of Art School of Design, which places him in a valuable position of being able to get early insight into young industry talent. Besides asking him what advice would he give a young person entering into this field, I was also curious to hear his thoughts on what are young designers today getting better at and getting worse at. That's a really good question. I could go on for quite a long time about this. Let's start with the good news. Yeah. <laughs> so they're getting so much better at learning new skills within technology. Industrial designers coming out of the uh, Design Products Masters course, so many of them know how to program like Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. They can code. They're not just focused on hardware. Mm -hmm. They've got a really deep understanding of the digital side of design. And they're great at sort of jumping into these future-focused areas of design, like computational design, where you create basically calculations and algorithms within CAD software to create the which adjusts your design to make it stronger, lighter, oh. more suitable for manufacturing, these sorts of things, using programs like Grasshopper and then obviously 3D printing. So that kind of thing that these technologies that have ramped up so quickly, even in the past five years, students are great at jumping into those mm -hmm. and teaching themselves these new skills. Yeah. On the flip side, what I see they're not so great at or not so, I guess, keen to get into is making things with their hands. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, getting in the workshop and actually testing things out. In reality, you you come across a lot of students who have come out of a undergraduate course and are now into their masters whose design process will involve quickly modeling something up on the computer. And then creating rendering after rendering after rendering of minor variations. And that's not really the way to get to understand an object. You've got to, you know, if you're a computer screen is still 2D, really. Yeah, yeah. You can't touch it. You can't handle it. If you're creating a three-dimensional object, you need to work in, in three dimensions and ideally at one-to-one -one scale. Yeah. So, you know, quickly working with paper, cardboard, foam, these sorts of things, and slowly into metal and wood as you, the, the design becomes more, more resolved, and then eventually into the real materials that the product will be made in. So I think there's an opportunity for a real, more of a melding of the, these two worlds of this very digitally driven design mm -hmm. process, which is, you know, at the computer versus the, the kind of the workshop techniques of, of quick mock-up making, test rigs, prototyping. Yeah. A knowledge of design history. Uh, lots of young designers and students, I guess, are really good at knowing about, you know, what's the latest thing on design, what was there this year at Milan, without kind of understanding that all these design pieces and projects coming out don't exist in isolation. They're all part of a historical timeline. They all, you know, 
they're all a continuation of something before them. So I think having a really strong understanding of, of design history can help designers to place their work and the work of others around them within that context. Yeah. So kind of continuing uh, down that path, like what advice would you give to a young person who is entering into design? I think the main thing right now these days would be to be flexible and open-minded about what design means right now as you're working on it and what it could mean in the future. You might go into design school thinking you want to be a furniture designer or a car designer or design mobile devices and all of a sudden find you're much more interested in robotics and AI and, and things like that. So, yeah. And you know, if you're an expert in those fields, it's probably going to be a lot easier to get a job when you get out. So just being open-minded and flexible. And also when you do come out or when you're doing your internships, find jobs that aren't just at the really cool studios whose portfolio of work you love, but find the ones where you're going to learn as much as possible. Smaller studios where you might get more responsibility and you might get be able to get thrown into the deep end. And oh yeah, you're going to need to be prepared to work really, really hard because it is competitive. Yeah. And in your studio, do you have like interns or do you offer internships or like entry level positions? I normally work with other designers uh, or assistants on a freelance basis. Mm -hmm. I kind of have this personal policy that's not written down or anything that I wouldn't offer an unpaid internship just because I think it's unfair on young designers coming out who might not be in the position to be able to work for free. So until... I can offer paid internships. I tend to hire slightly more experienced, you know, people with one to two years who can come into the studio and just get straight into things and they'll be working with me on a freelance basis. Yeah. And so what are you looking for in those people when you're like hiring them or like screening their portfolio and CV and, and having an interview? Like what are some of the things that are like important to you? An understanding of materials and manufacturing processes is a really big thing. So not just being able to imagine a beautiful new thing, but to understand how it actually goes together and to be able to, you know, design things appropriate to their materials, appropriate to how they're made, appropriate to how they're used. So those kind of practical skills are a pretty big one. And I guess just a really strong, clean aesthetic sensibility, because mm -hmm. then that way, you know, if, if they have an aesthetics that's sort of aligned with the studio, then it's going to be easier to for them to translate the work that's going yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. A work of a creative professional most often entails much more than merely doing the activity which is implied by the title. I was interested in hearing what Tim's work routines are. So I try to get in to the studio about 8.30, 9 o'clock at the latest if I can. And lately I've been trying to give myself like an hour and a half limit on sort of admin tasks like organizing finances, chasing invoices, filing receipts, you know, quick emails that need to be sent out and things like that. Otherwise it can you can just spend up end up spending all day doing that kind of thing. And then at a certain point it's like, okay, right, cut off time. Now it's focusing on the design work. So ideally by 1030 when I'm getting up to make probably coffee number two of the day, you know, that stuff shuts down and then I'm I'm straight into the design work. And then, yeah, days have to be flexible because of the breadth of clients I'm working for on projects. From day to day, I might be, I might spend most of the day on the computer finishing off, you know, a CAD model and, and pumping out the technical drawings for someone to make something. Or I might be doing, you know, a whole day of really hands-on stuff, making prototypes and mock-ups. So it is, it is flexible. Probably twice, three times a month, I'll be traveling for work. So visiting factories, visiting clients, I've got the my client base at the currently is spread across the UK, Denmark, Australia, and New Zealand. So it's kind of opposite ends of the world. I don't get to get down to Australia and New Zealand too often. They'll often come over here because especially for the Australian brand I'm working for, their manufacturing is in Italy. So when we're at a particular phase of a project, I'll shoot over to Italy quite often to review prototypes and look at uh, samples and things like that, sort of fine-tuning the, the production product. And then I try to leave at a fairly reasonable time. I've recently become a dad about four months ago, so all of a sudden I don't really feel the need to be in the studio till really late at night or on the weekends. Yeah. <laughs> and somehow it, it seems to have not really affected my efficiency at all. I can just get a lot more done because, you know, I waste less time in the studio. Yeah. I've got a better reason to get home, even, even with the job I love. <laughs> Yeah, I often hear that. Like, I always assume like, oh, having kids might be like distraction in a way, like impairment to like being able to do 
work that you want to be doing and like be as ambitious as you want to be but actually it yep. sounds that it's kind of like opposite it makes you prioritize yeah. things and be more effective in what you're doing yeah definitely it's also a really nice excuse to to say no to things that don't really make sense yeah yeah <laughs> like projects and things like that you like look no sorry i don't have time to take that on at the moment whereas before it was kind of like you almost said yes to everything <laughs> yeah Mainly due to the disruptive cultural forces, it seems that it's becoming increasingly difficult to manage our creative careers. Nowadays, we have to navigate much more than what would traditionally be seen as our job. I've asked him to share what he thinks are the main challenges of being an industrial designer working today. I think the main one is how competitive it is, especially in a city like London. I, know, I can imagine in Copenhagen as well. Yeah. There's a lot of designers out there these days. I mean, design schools are pumping out a lot of design graduates. So it becomes really, really competitive, not only to get jobs at good companies and studios, but also when you're running your own studio to get projects happening with, with the brands you want to work with because, you know, they're seeing hundreds and hundreds of proposals via email every day. So the, the competitiveness is hard. I think once you kind of get in with clients you, you work well with and, and you guys have a real synergy, then it's easier because you can keep those conversations going. So it's great to be able to have fewer stronger relationships with clients i think yeah i think another thing is i guess it's maybe in the last 10 years and and i'd probably put it mostly down to social media is the public and the media's appetite for newness and design mm -hmm. you know everything has to be new everything has to be the latest i mean i've heard of interior design studios kind of banning people from using a particular light because they've seen too much of it and i think things get so saturated so quickly that you know people are people do get sick of things quickly especially if they're if something has an aspect about it that's that's quite trend driven mm -hmm. i guess if you talk to like a pr or marketing consultant they'll be like you know you, your instagram needs to have you know this much new content on it it's like whoa what hang on i'm only working on this many projects <laughs> Yeah. I can only take so many angles of each prototype. <laughs> yeah. Or sample. That's quite tough because it's a full time job. Yeah. There's a lot of work to do to create really good quality content. It's not just something you can fire off every now and again. Yeah. But do you think it's, is that becoming like actually a necessary part of your, let's say, work and a crucial part or not? Because often it's like a, it's good to have it, but there's other things which are more important than like, not having yeah like a good social media account or yeah content like you can probably do without it and you'll be fine if you yeah i think i mean obviously if you don't have great work to post about then it's, there's no point in having a great social media profile yeah. i think if you're more established you can get away with it and i think sometimes if you're you know if you've got really strong relationships with clients and they have you know their marketing really well sorted then mm -hmm. you know you don't need to in a way some mystique about a studio or a designer who doesn't have a presence on social media but when you're you know this competitiveness that i was talking about you know you've got to it's a way to get seen by brands and by potential clients yeah. that is a lot easier than it used to be like i remember before things like squarespace and as well as instagram and platforms like that it was quite a pain to update your website or get just get some images of your latest work online so it's good in that sense but yeah i think you do have to be careful about how much energy you put into it updating websites and instagram posts if they're like fully work related ones that is definitely falls within that one and a half hours per day of admin work as it get distracting yeah a crucial factor, which is a frequent source of struggle for creative professionals, is making enough money to earn yourself a decent living. At this point in our conversation, I've asked him to talk about that aspect of his work, and I'm grateful that he was open about how he manages that. I work on quite a typical industrial design studio model where projects are either charged as design fees or royalties or a mixture of both. Obviously, if it's a mixture, the fees would be less than a purely fee project and the royalties would be less than a purely royalty project when you're starting out the royalties are zero obviously it takes you know it can take two years for your first well-selling product to even hit the shelves and then another year for that to actually the sales to ramp up to a point where you're you're making the the royalties you should off it 
So the first two, three years is actually really tough because if you roughly split your time 50-50 between royalty-based projects and fee-paying projects, you're basically earning half the amount for the work you're doing for those first three years because the royalties aren't coming in yet, but you've got to work really hard on those projects because if you're making a royalty off them, they've got to be good. They've got to sell well. They've got to be relevant. They've got to be commercial. So I guess I'm at the point now where that's starting to balance out where I've got a few collections, a couple of projects out there with some really great brands that are actually starting to pay a decent amount of royalties. But obviously, the consulting side is still really important. I'm not at the point where I could just work on, you know, have the income completely covered by existing projects that are out there paying royalties. And then, you know, you're just working on the next launch to sort of top that up as things tail off. I think that's another reason the um, the desire for newness is kind of a scary thing for product designers, because we'll spend two years sweating the details on a product, getting something exactly perfect. And then if it's only like desirable for one season, it it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. So yeah, I guess, I don't know, I guess it would be like a 60-40 split between consulting and royalties at the mm-hmm. moment. Some clients are happy to pay a complete design fee for design work. Some prefer a, a mix. In fact, these days it's most common is probably a mix, mm-hmm. of design fee plus royalty. You know, the it reduces the risk for both sides, but also there's the the impetus for the, the designer to create something that's going to sell yeah. really, really well. There's an incentive. Yep. And were there any perhaps like mistakes or things that you weren't aware of when we, you were like starting when it comes to the financial side? The way I went about my career, I think, mitigated a little bit of that by the time I was ready to start my own studio because I'd worked at lots of different studios from Formworks back in New Zealand to an office called Priestman Good in London, then on to Tom Dixon. And then I was design director for products at Conrad and Partners, also in London. And I kind of got to learn a lot of that stuff working for other people with other people who knew how to do this. Mm-hmm. By the time I came around to signing my own sort of design proposals or royalty agreements, I'd already had a hand in writing yeah. know, dozens of yeah. them. Yeah, okay. So I think that was really useful, learning that kind of thing then, Yeah, where you've got other people to pick up on your mistakes for you bef- before you make them. Yeah, exactly. To develop professionally, we have to invest in ourselves and our practice. We can do that with things like courses, travel, or investigating new tools and processes. I've asked him what he thought was the best investment that he made in himself recently. I think it was finding a good studio space that had enough room for me to work the way I really wanted to. London's a really expensive place to have a studio. The rents on on studios are, are crazy and, and lots of professions. You can work in these new sort of hot desking type yeah. offices where you know you pay for one desk but a product designer especially one working in at a furniture scale if you need a workshop to make things you sim- that's simply not not a possibility so i moved my studio a little bit outside of the center of, of where i'd ideally like to be although hackney work is kind of known as a place where there's lots of creative studios and artist studios and and things like that so it was actually spending the time to find that space that A, I could afford and B, had enough room for me to to spread out with models and prototypes and also to grow because moving office can be a nightmare. Yeah. In terms of an investment in myself, I think it was that that 10 years of, of working for other people. You know, it can be tough if you've got ambitions to work for yourself and be running your own projects to spend that amount of time doing that. But I think it was invaluable what I learned yeah and doing that and was that something that you were very like intentional about um, were you from the start kind of aware okay i want to be independent but like i have to like this is a wise strategic way of learning and growing and then i'll be able to do what i want to do yeah definitely it was it was always my intention to to have my own studio but i did know that there's so much to learn and i also kind of wanted to figure out not what I the type of work I wanted to be doing because I I kind of knew that but more how I wanted to run a business basically you know how I wanted the setup to be how I wanted the relationships with clients to be and that that sort of thing so I worked in lots of different places architecture offices work in a very different way with their clients than say a branding agency does and I've I've worked in elements of of all of them so it was fine tuning that kind of how do I want the setup to be eventually. And so could you describe that setup? Well at the moment it's me and one to two normally freelance designers 
sort of ass- working, assisting on projects. So, you know, three maximum at the moment. I think I'd like to maybe grow that to a maximum of six to eight. I'd like to, to keep a studio that's kind of small and agile because something I learned about working, especially at a director level in bigger organizations is, is you know, you have to be a bit hands off from the design side of things. You've got different responsibilities. And they were things I just wasn't as passionate about as actually designing. So I think if you can manage your ambitions, I think you can financially and scale wise, you can probably be a lot happier and just as successful. Hey friends, you're listening to the Creative Voyage podcast. We are roughly in the middle of this episode, so it's time for a short break. There's no team behind this show. It's solely produced and edited by me, Mario. I don't have any sponsors and I have no plans to add any. Nevertheless, I can use all the help I can get growing the show. If you like what you've heard so far, there's three simple things you can do for me and future episodes. Number one, review the show on Apple Podcasts. Number two, tell a friend and share a link on social media. And number three, visit the shop on creative.voyage slash shop and support the show by buying bespoke Creative Voyage products. Thanks everyone, let's get back to the show. If we want to remain relevant and excited about what we're doing, we need to grow and challenge ourselves. I've asked him how is he making sure that besides working on the client assignments, he also develops as a designer and creative professional. Teaching is part of that. Obviously, there, there's an amazing team of other tutors there who are all design professionals in their own right from different fields and talking to them and understanding how they work, that sort of thing is great. London's an amazing city for working with and, and then becoming friends with other designers from different fields as well. So, you know, trying to absorb different aspects of different creative professions and using them in in your own work, I think is a really great way to grow as a professional. I also think there's this, there is this learning curve that every designer goes through once they get to a certain level of experience, and that's relinquishing a bit of control, Mm -hmm. hiring younger designers whose work is great and you really trust and allowing them to have a little bit of freedom. I think that's probably the, the toughest and probably the most important growth spurt I'll call it that uh, that a designer has to go through. Yeah, that's for sure something that I'm struggling with at the moment. Yep. I'm getting there, but I'm like at the very early stage of that. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's a tricky one. It's almost like I've had to do it twice because I had to do it as I had different... Uh, when I was at Tom Dixon, I was design manager there. So I was working on some of the more technically complex products that maybe required someone with a bit more experience. But for the other ones, I was writing briefs for a young but exceedingly talented team, small team of designers. And I had to be able to you know, write that brief, hand it to them, let them run with it, mentor them, advise them on things, you know, make sure the product was being steered in the right direction in terms of sort of relevance to the brand and you know, commercial realities, but not starting to meddle with their work because you know, they, were, they were producing great work. Yeah. I might have done a couple of things slightly differently, but if they were more personal approaches and not because it was to make the product better, then I, you, know, you have to step back from that. Yeah. At this point in our conversation, I was curious to hear what are Tim's current professional challenges. Among other things, that led us to talk about the importance of finding the right clients. Also, Tim shared a simple and effective process he uses to evaluate potential projects. I guess it is the studio is kind of at the point where to grow further, there's kind of a jump into hiring permanent Mm -hmm. employees because obviously working with freelancers is quite expensive. It can be if they're not available, all of a sudden you've got a deadline, it becomes quite stressful. Usually they're in for a longer period of time. But yeah, it's making that jump to to taking on full-time staff. And when you've only had yourself to, to keep alive yeah. <laughs> from the studio for a little while, that that's quite a difficult jump to make. Yeah, exactly. So you're currently, let's say, in that phase? Yeah. Well, I think because I've got I've got other designers working with me on projects, when it's busy enough, it is very much a studio now, not, you know, I'm not an independent designer. I've got a big space to pay for. I've got professional indemnity and yeah. liability insurance and all these sorts of things. And I've got, I guess, a level of expertise and experience now where I can genuinely bring something to my clients that I'm working with that they might not otherwise be able to access. So it is very much a, a studio. But you know, for the first year, 
also, it was very much, I was a freelancer who was working on some of my own projects on the side. So that transition's kind of happened, but it is, it is still kind of, I think it takes a long time to bridge that gap. And there's a weird area in between. Yeah. And what was so far the biggest challenge you had? Like when you look through your, like finishing your studies to where you're now? I think when I started my own studio, going out and getting clients, that's... I think everyone finds it the most terrifying idea yeah. and getting the right clients as well. Because when you start out, you got to say yes to everything that, that comes along. But if you end up working on things that aren't part of your long-term goal, it distracts you from maybe working on finding or starting up opportunities with the brands you really want to work with. So I think maintaining that focus while still actually having an income yeah. is probably the biggest challenge. So having that balance of saying yes to most opportunities, but at the same time being aware of, okay, where do I want to go? Yep. And I mean, sometimes, you know, you have to run a tight ship. You, you know, you can't have the studio that you want in the area you want. You've got to keep that five-year-old MacBook Pro running. <laughs> you can't go straight out and get a 3D printer. You know, your trips to trade shows and to, to factories are all on Ryanair and EasyJet. So, <laughs> you know, it's you've got to be careful yeah. so that you don't force yourself into having to take on the wrong kind of work that does, not the wrong kind of work, but, you know, the work that doesn't make sense and really contribute to your end goal. I think there's kind of three criteria that you need to apply to a project. It's A, it, it has to be, properly financially viable for you as a studio it's you wanted to build your profile and be with brands that you're proud to be working with and it's got to be able to result in a product that you're going to be really really proud of so you've got to have at least two of those yeah exactly yeah <laughs> and at the beginning you're like even if i get one it's fine <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly yeah <laughs> based on a lot of markers we live in a world of material abundance our markets are saturated, and some would argue oversaturated with all sorts of products. It can be overwhelming for our souls and puts a strain on the environment. Industrial designers are indeed a part of that ecosystem, where at one hand it can be so easy to get lost, to just copy and be irrelevant, and on the other, perhaps only to contribute to the general confusion and pollution. I think it has never been more important to be intentional and mindful about how to approach that work. And I believe that Tim is successful in navigating it through creating iconic and relevant products with true perennial potential. So I've asked him what makes a good contemporary product for him and how he goes about trying to create one. I think the TAR bulb was a great example of that because not only does it have an aesthetic that resonates with people and especially coming from a brand like Menu, it, it felt very much like a menu product, but it was also, it was solving a genuine need and creating that solution through sort of resolving this problem in a technically elegant way. So I guess that takes a little bit of the pressure off, you know, trying to make it fit with too many sort of transient trends and things like that, because you're able to design something that, that actually solves a problem. I mean, it, it kind of sounds like a cliche yeah. <laughs> when industrial designers talk about being problem solvers, but it does, it is still an important part of what we do and ensures that a product isn't doesn't become just kind of like a one-liner. Yeah, so I think, and I also find myself getting more excited about products or projects where there is some kind of technical challenge that I need to solve. I think that's just inherent in the way I like to work. Yeah. So what are some of those like maybe other criteria that you have when you're either evaluating like a product that you're making or maybe when you see like a product like you i'm sure you your brain like whenever you see a product you're probably thinking like of all the <laughs> different aspects of it it's the same like when i see like a piece of design i just like look at all the type and all the spacing and everything and just like analyze yep. it so i'm curious like what are those things that you're yeah looking at i think i really admire products that are quite i guess efficient in the way that they're they're made so you know they're elements or parts to do multiple jobs in terms of holding things together. You know, really elegantly reduced technical solutions in a product in terms of the way it's assembled or the way it works or the way it moves. That's something that I get quite excited about, mm -hmm. I think. To use an example, there's a stool by the Danish designer Paul Kerholm. I can't remember the name, the number of it, but it has a bent steel frame and then a plywood shell on top of which there's a leather cushion. But the 
plywood shell is held onto the legs by a basic, really simple rubber O-ring oh. that loops through a couple of a couple of slots in the in the shell. And it's just the most beauty is in the almost crudeness of how it's done and, and the efficiency. And, you know, they could have made a new bracket to attach that and, and use some screws, but there's this beautifully efficient and almost obvious way of holding these two pieces together. I think that's those are the sorts of things that get me quite excited. And also a product where every little detail has been considered, even on the inside where you don't, you know, where you don't normally see the industrial designer's hand. Every little detail, whether the customer sees it or not, that being well considered and and well ordered and proportioned and and laid out, I think is is really important to me. So, could you talk a bit about your design process? And I don't mean just like like the development of a certain like mm-hmm. just just the product itself, but the whole process of which is entailed with developing, for example, a product for a brand that can be like an example. Yep. So from even from the initial like meetings to briefs to the creative work to yep. the prototyping, marketing, like just also kind of try to put it in a context of like time, like how does how long does do those things take? Because I think it'd okay. be interesting to get that insight. Yeah, I mean the time thing's tricky because some products can take, you know, two, three years and some, you know, the design's done in a couple of weeks, <laughs> depending on what the product is. There's two ways I tend to work. So often when I'm working with a brand, they will, they'll send me a brief and say, hey, we've, there's this opportunity within our range. We think we need, to, we need to design something for or we need to update this area of our, of our collection. And, you know, we'll work together on a brief. The other way is where I will have just noticed something, you know, a problem that there's, there's currently no solution to or a different way of doing something. And often when it's that way, the idea will sit in my head for quite a long time before I even sort of start drawing it or or get on the computer or, or start making it in the workshop. I'll kind of play around with it and let it, I guess, not take on any form until I'm a bit more sure about it. On the flip side, when I'm working with clients, obviously it's much more of a conversation where, you know, they've asked for something and I, I tend to show them a few different ways of going about it. Sometimes if I think I understand the brand well enough and what they're doing, it'll I'll develop a an idea a little bit more and, and give them one design with some variations on it. It all depends on on the brand and the product and, and the way we work together. So often drawing will be how I kind of start to give shape to an idea and, and or start to communicate it to other people. But quite quickly after that, once the ideas had time to bounce around in my head for a while, I'll go quite quickly into working in three dimensions. So actually trying to get real materials in my hands or play with real forms through quick paper modeling, uh, cardboard, those sorts of things and bouncing between that and the computer. So in a way I'll, so for example, if I'm doing a chair, I'll create a really sort of rough wireframe in 3d of, of how, what I think it should be. And then I'll print out elements of that, you know, stick them together, look at it. It'll be like really rough. It won't even look like the product. It'll just be a loose form or silhouette at that point. And then that'll go back into the computer and then back out into making things. So I'm just constantly adjusting between these, this virtual and physical way of working, sort of refining, using each tool to do what it does best. So in a way, the, the computer, I'm using that to record what I do to the model and then at the end, at the, the computer starts to take over more because I need to communicate more detailed information to manufacturers and, and things like that. So it seamlessly goes from this very hands-on analog way of working and sort of melds into a slightly more technical approach using the power of you know CAD, 3D CAD software and 3D printing to make more resolved mock-ups and prototypes. And obviously, there's also an understanding of of the market that you need to have. I don't tend to do, I guess, mood boards and things like that, because I think there's always a risk there of the closest information to hand is lots of stuff that's going on right now. Mm, Yeah. And you do run the risk of kind of homogenizing your own aesthetic with everything that's on sort of these image board tumblers and, and blogs. I mean, I still obviously you know, look at them from time to time. But I try to look outside of design as well. There was a detail on the backrest of a, a chair I designed for SP1, the Australian brand, where it was the bracket that held the backrest was actually inspired by this really rough engineering technique where you take a tube of steel and you just crush it flat to make a place to put a screw through. Oh, okay. It's little things like that. And trying to, it's quite hard, but actually trying to somehow keep a record 
of all those little things that you notice that could turn into something else, whether it's just using your the camera on your phone or the uh, 100% of the time have a A5 sketchbook on me. So I'll often use that or, yeah, just whatever camera I have to try and record these. Yeah. Not things from the design world, but from parallel sectors, mm -hmm. I guess. And then, like, how does the process, like, continues when, like, let's say the product is defined when you're about to go into like manufacturing like how does that work i really enjoy that part and because i've had a lot of experience in product development usually the brands i work with like to get me quite involved in that part it's not just i'll send off the 3d files and then i'll go go see the prototype i'll often work really closely with their engineering department and their their production team to get things working right you know to get to try and realize the design intent as close as possible to or better than how i imagined it in the start because the design very rarely comes out exactly as that first cad file that you send away and if you're doing it right usually it comes out better because when you start working really closely with manufacturers and and production people people who understand that material and that process better than you could ever hope to is when you actually see the opportunities to do things in a slightly different and maybe better way so i get try to get as vol as involved as possible in that part of the process it'll be lots of emails going back and forth factory visits you know making little prototype parts here to send over to them to look at and back and forth. Yeah. Uh, so I get quite excited about that part of it. Even if our career trajectory seems overall successful, that doesn't free us from running into obstacles. I've asked him to share some of the mistakes he made and failures he experienced on his professional journey. Well, there's one that kind of sticks out for me earlier on in my career. I designed a piece for a new brand. They had some great credentials behind them. It all seemed right. And I, the contract I set up handed over all the intellectual property rights to them because, you know, that's kind of how they wanted to run it. Unfortunately, the, the brand sort of never happened. <laughs> There's prototypes of the piece floating around. It was sold for a little bit, but it never really happened in the way that I imagined or I, or I think they imagined really. Yeah. So there's this design out there that I absolutely love and I think is great, but I can't take it to anyone else <laughs> to get it back in production. Oh, that's a shame. So I think that was a mistake is to retain your IP. Yeah. Now that you're structuring your contracts, you try to keep that. Yeah. I, except in very particular circumstances always. Yeah. Is there anything else? Oh, there's probably loads. Well, actually, <laughs> on a sort of a pragmatic side of things is my old studio, which was in Hackney near London Field. It was a bit smaller, but it was in a great location. Uh, got flooded last year a sprinkler went off and just destroyed everything because you can imagine a sprinkler going off when you've got printers 3d printers computers cameras all that sort of thing paper models of all your your products it was a disaster and i had insurance obviously because as a designer you need it for you know professional and indemnity and public liability but i had you know i'd insured myself based on the stuff I had when I started out. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So, you know, there wasn't enough to cover every little of kit that I had. I mean, it's pretty impossible to do that, but I would say if you can over-insure. Okay. Because <laughs> you're always going to buy like a new lens for your camera or, you know, that, that new piece of kit and you never know when disaster is going to strike. We've come to the last topic I've discussed with Tim. And as with other guests, I've asked him to highlight three pieces of advice based on what he learned so far. Here's what Tim shared with me. I think the first one is try as hard as you can and work really hard at understanding your craft with intense depth. It is competitive out there. There are lots of creative professionals. There are lots of designers. You do kind of need to be an expert in your field or an expert at something. You need some kind of angle that makes your approach to your work unique that isn't what everyone else is doing. And I think for me, what I did is I tried to, I guess I'm a little bit nerdy and technically minded. So it was quite easy for me to you know, have a really strong push on manufacturing processes and materials. That's often seen more in designers who are working on much more technical products than maybe in, in furniture and lighting. But I try to, you know, that's the strong point that I always try and work on and and utilize yeah. in projects. I think not contrary to that, but on the other side is to learn the, to speak the language of your collaborators. So the marketeers, the engineers, salespeople, even the, the people in logistics and the brands you're working for, they all play a really important part in getting your ideas 
into the hands of people. So you got to treat them like a critical part of your team. You can push each other. You know, the the kind of designer, industrial designer, engineer relationships always, a, there's always a bit of tension there. Yeah. But you need to do it with empathy for their role. You can't just come in and say, no, I'm the designer. This is how I've decided things should be. You have to make it work like that. You need to understand that they're a part of your team and they do really, really important work. So learning to speak their language, understanding their terminology, know what their role is about so you can get the most out of each other is really important. I also think now that I've been running my own studio, the third thing and final thing is don't forget your job. (laughs) So it's, you know, the main thing you're there to do for me is to design great products for brands that people want to buy. You can get caught up in all the admin and it can almost be like a distraction and a way of procrastinating. You can sit there and it gets to lunchtime and you're like, wow, all my invoices and all my receipts are so beautifully filed and I've made this amazing spreadsheet for tracking <laughs> everything. That's not what people are paying you for. It can feel like you're being really diligent and doing what you should be doing. Yeah. But in reality, it's actually a distraction from the most important thing you do. Hey friends, thank you for tuning in once again. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I believe we touched on a lot of useful information for anybody out there interested in industrial and product design and growth as creative professionals. I want to thank Tim for coming onto the show. I admire his products, his approach, and I'm grateful for the insights he shared with me. Links to Tim's work, as well as to some other things mentioned during our conversation, can be found in the show notes at creative.voyage slash podcast. You can follow at creative.voyage on Instagram, and you can also email me directly on hello at creative.voyage. Let me know what you think of the show. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe, and until next time, my friends, Take care.